My guest today is Debbie Levitt, an author, speaker, and trainer, and boy, is she going to shake up some of the things that you think you know about UX. I'm Dylan Winspear and the host of the Design Today podcast. Thanks for giving this episode a listen. I promise it won't disappoint. Debbie comes packed with years of experience in the industry. Recently, she just launched her newest book titled Delta CX, where she self-promotes that many of the things that you've been taught about UX and business is wrong. And in her book, she burns it to the ground. She is a huge promoter of the idea where we stop evangelizing UX and she'll share some insights on what to do instead. Give today's episode a listen and check out the link to her book in the details of this episode. Debbie Levitt, thank you for joining me on the podcast. Well, hey, thanks for having me. Thank you so much. It's been great to connect with you on LinkedIn. Yeah, and I've had a lot of people reach out and ask, has a recording happened yet? Has it, has it happened yet? Ever since we uh, had that quick public conversation that we needed to have this podcast, uh, there are people <laughs> eagerly anticipating this recording happening. So I'm really grateful of your time and helping me make this happen. Well, thanks to you and thanks to the fans for your patience. <laughs> um, let me go ahead and give, your, give you an opportunity to introduce yourself and tell me a little bit about your background in UX and what you're up to today. Yeah, sure. Basically, I started in uh, around 1995, and uh, I'm not an artist, so I started out building websites based on psychology classes I took for fun in college. And so without really knowing what UX was, you could say I was kind of doing UX because I was trying to do web design from the perspective of human psychology without having learned all the formalities yet and eventually I did and so I transitioned into more formal UX and then uh, I lived in the Bay Area from like 2010 to 2017 and I did a lot of contracting I held a lot of jobs there and kind of worked my way up and then said all right I've worked my way up time to go back to quality of life and something a little more inexpensive and I moved away but during all this time, I've been running my own agency, which uh, I like to call P-Type, short for prototype, because we love to make uh, realistic UX prototypes. And so outside of that, let's see, you can find me singing. Uh, you can find me writing another book. So as we're recording this, it's uh, August. Um, I am writing Delta CX, which hopefully will be out by the time that uh, people are hearing this and they can rush to Amazon and check it out. That's awesome. When's the release date of that book? This is a self-imposed release date, so this is the hopeful release okay. date. Um, I'm I'm shooting for September nine ish, but it's uh, you know, it's it's just a number because I'm I'm doing a uh, closing keynote at the big design conference in Dallas in uh, later in September. So I would love for the book to be ready to be able to um, give some away or present that to the audience. So that's kind of my self-imposed deadline. Is there any uh, pre-purchases available? Right now, no. I haven't put it up on Amazon. Amazon doesn't seem great with some of that when you're doing self-publishing. Okay. They keep expecting me to load up final manuscripts and things like that, and we're still writing and editing it. So um, so you cannot pre-publish, you, can, you can't pre-buy it, but I would just say, hey, everybody, just go to Amazon, search for Delta CX, and uh, hopefully something will come up, and, yeah. and hopefully you'll feel like buying it. I'll have a link to that uh, in the description of this podcast episode as well so we can uh, link great, people over thanks. to it. Uh, that's great. And you are no longer in San Francisco. Where are you at currently? No, I, you know, I spend a lot of time in America because I still have a lot of North American clients. I do a lot of uh, training. I do a lot of conference speaking. So you can find me in America a lot, but I made the quality of life move to Italy. Which is really funny when we started talking because I said, so are, are you Italian? Do you have roots in Italy? And you said. <laughs> no, uh, no, I have quality of life interest and, and food baby. Oh, my God, the food here. I just, oh, my God, my metabolism. What happened? Um, 
No, no, it was really um, ha- partially having seen it when I did uh, a vacation a few years ago and partially uh, to start my business here and to try to get more European customers, which is something I always wanted to do. I felt like in America, even with the Internet, it's sometimes hard to reach out to European customers. And so I felt like this would be a great opportunity. And one might say I am also dating an Italian guy. So all of these things converge for for a, a, a good life. A good quality of life. That's fantastic. It's uh, actually quite yeah. admirable that you've taken that opportunity to step aside and to search out that quality of life. I think a lot of people get caught up in climbing ladders and climbing corporate America, and that gets uh, a little bit more uh, difficult to leave once you get so involved. So that's really cool. Leading by yeah, example there. Um, we had the opportunity. Exactly. We had the opportunity to talk about a couple of themes and topics that uh, uh, you've got a lot of thought behind and a lot of passion behind. So I want to just jump right into it while we've got the opportunity. Um, where would you like to start? What, where's your, your mind at right now as it comes to the UX as an industry and where, where the, the ball seems to be heading? Yeah, um, I've been very frustrated with a lot of where it's headed. I know others are as well, especially those who are a little more veteran. I think the the people who are newer are like, where's my entry level job? And the people who are not as new are like, why do I keep showing up to a job that seems to want me to be a short order cook and just take orders or be some sort of facilitator of workshops and design by committee? Where When do I get to really show you my specialty? and and my strengths. And so I, I feel like one of the first things that's on my mind is I, I know you said a lot of the listeners here are possibly newer to UX. And my first message to them before we talk about all the other things on our list would probably be um, a, a lot of the question is, do I need to learn to code? And I want to just jump right in there and say, sure, you don't. In my world, it's okay for you to be a specialist. If you find you are an amazing researcher and you love researching, maybe you don't learn to code. Maybe you poke around it a little bit, but you don't have to be a coder. Now, if you want to do data science and that side of research and analysis, yes, data scientists do code. Many of them have master's degrees and PhDs, so that's an example of where you do need that advanced education. But I feel like picking coding is almost arbitrary because when I think about, and and I write about this in the book, when I think about who are some of UX's potential greatest untapped allies, I think about the marketing department. We are usually enemies with the marketing department, Mm -hmm. but wouldn't it be great if we really learned more about what they're doing and found ways to partner with them? Because they usually have company support, company money. They've got structure and hierarchy. They've got tools. They've got a lot of the things that we've been like, where's mine? And these would be great partners for us. And it goes together really well because we would be the people who would be following through on some of their goals and initiatives, or we would be the people telling them their goals and initiatives need some changing. So my current advice for people is you don't have to learn to code. But I have to tell you, recently I've been hanging out at DevOps conferences Uh, Not just for the kicks or the free croissants, but really because I've been speaking there. I've been on a speaking tour to explain to non-UX roles what the heck we do and how we can fit in better. And I have to say, just hanging around DevOps conferences has given me a little bit of knowledge and understanding about DevOps. And that has helped me talk to engineers and speak their language more than if I started trying to learn Java. Mm -hmm. You know, in reality, if I learned some Java, does an engineer want me to code? I have a degree in music, you know? So I'm. So how much coding should I do, even if I learn it? And how long would it take me to learn it really well? So I, I would have to say I'm kind of a want, learn to code if that's in your heart. Don't learn to code if it's not in your heart. Branch out in other ways. What do you, what do you think? Well, I, I totally agree. <laughs> and I've found there to be quite a bit of benefit in just being able to, as you said, speak the language of developers, but actually not be in the coding industry, you know, uh, or doing it by trade. I've been fortunate enough to really spend most of my last seven, eight years uh, specifically with mobile developers who are developing native iOS uh, and native Android apps. And I couldn't code a native Android or iOS app for the life of me. But I've also picked up on the lingo and I've picked up on some of the the pieces that 
uh, are important to them uh, so that I know how to better translate or communicate uh, my designs. You know, quick example is we, we call, we're designing on artboards and well, a developer doesn't call this an artboard. So if you're in a presentation saying, you know, looking at this artboard here and this artboard here, that's not kind of, that's not jiving, but you know, an iOS developer calls this a view. And so this view here and this view here, uh, you know, sometimes we call it screens or interfaces, but a developer calls it a view. And so just being able to know some of those things really helps facilitate better collaboration and handoff between design and development. Is that kind of what you've seen? Totally agree. Is that what you've seen as you started to, to understand how to speak better with developers? Yeah, I mean, obviously going on a speaking tour to speak mostly to engineers, mm -hmm. I invite them to give me their horror stories of when they've worked with UX people and had negative experiences. And I learned a lot about why people hate us, uh -huh. you know, and some of it is the prejudice of you're just an artsy fartsy hipster. And that's when I have to tell them I'm a terrible artist. I have no tattoos, you know, like, uh, okay, I'm you're gonna have to break that one. You're gonna have to break that stereotype. But, um, but a lot of them had really valid complaints. And what a lot of those complaints typically boil down to was someone got a UX job at a company but was really unqualified. Mm -hmm. They were either unqualified because they were really artists who felt if they made wireframes they were doing UX and of course there, there's only so much of UX you're doing if you really just make wireframes without research and testing and other things that go into the process. Um, there were also issues with people who were high ego. There were issues with people who didn't collaborate. I heard so many stories about UX disappeared for three to six months. They designed this thing. They threw it over a wall at us. And then we said, oh, my gosh, we can't build this. And UX said, too bad, we're on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And I, and my thought was like, holy cats, fire all these people. This is part of what's dragging our industry down. This is part of what's making other teams and departments say, how do we take power away from these people? How do we minimize what these people are doing? How do we deal with these people less? And that unfortunately ends up reinforcing the silo. Because one complaint you'll hear about UX all the time is, oh, they're so siloed. But the funny thing is, everyone is part of that silo cycle. You know, we're siloing ourselves sometimes because we don't want to deal with engineers or other people. Not me, I love them, but some people. And then product managers, engineers, other people, they're like, oh God, UX, you know, they're just going to, mm, they're going to kill our good ideas. They're going to make this take longer. You know, let, let's just leave them out. And so that's siloing too. So, uh, so obviously I'm on a mission to create better understanding between teams of what we really do and what we can do and what we should do on a project and, and burn down those silos. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Do you think uh, there's a solution then to that? I mean, what is the solution to getting out of these silos? Yeah, the, the solution is definitely better collaboration. Um, I, um, I have a model that I share with people where uh, we need to collaborate first within ourselves, within the UX and CX team, then with product to make sure that we're matching the vision, the requirements, the stories, to, just to make sure we didn't miss anything. Not because we need product's approval on everything we do, but in the spirit of collaboration, hey, did I miss something? Then we'll show it to engineering and say, Okay, product digs this. We seem to have met the requirements and found all the user stories. Can you guys build this? Right. Now, of course, before I start building, I go to engineering and I go, here's what this project looks like. Here's some directions I might go in. Is there anything I need to know about limitations? Is there anything I need to know about security? Is there anything I need to know about some other piece? Do we need to bring in some data people to talk to? So I always start with a collaboration, uh, collaboration with engineering, and then I make sure I collaborate with them weekly, if not multiple times weekly. Again, not for their approval, not for them to overrule me and say we have a better way. I want to hear ideas, but I don't love being overruled but then to make sure that what I'm building can be built so nobody feels surprised later. Hey, Debbie threw this design at us and we couldn't build it. She's a jerk. Yep. No, and I totally agree. One of the things that we've had to do to adapt our process that where I work full time is create kind of a, a pattern where we have multiple check-ins throughout our design process. And of course, three years ago, I think UX designers were they were really frustrated because our check-ins always had to do with our stakeholders, like our executives. And we were having multiple check-ins with executives and then developers were on the tail end of it going like, okay, so you guys have all had all these wild conversations and now we're left to build it. And one, we don't have time. Two, we don't have technology. Three, we don't have, you know, yada, yada, yada. 
And so we had... It shouldn't be a surprise. Right. So we adapted that to have all these different check-ins so that developers were involved early on in the process. But let me ask you a question because I know one of the things that you're not exactly for is this kind of idea of design by commu committee. So how do you avoid yeah. the design by committee when you've got so many check-ins with other people? Yeah, I think that, that that's certainly a, a little subtle, but um, I believe that people with the right personality, and especially people who are a little more senior, might be more comfortable establishing those boundaries. Um, because when you think about it, product may talk to us about their roadmap and, and the features that are coming, but they really don't want us to write the roadmap with them. Mm -hmm. And it, engineers might talk to us about frameworks and technologies, but they don't want us to decide with them what frameworks they're going to use. But magically, in UX, somehow everyone is a designer or wants to be a designer, and that ends up getting expressed through things like um, design by committee meetings and workshops, whether you're, they're design sprints or something else. And I definitely want to see us start pushing back against those because I believe so. So what I propose in my book is there's a way to have ideation sessions with people where we can get them to be way more informed about the problem than your typical design workshop, because the typical design workshop is let's sketch some solutions. Mm -hmm. Let's just get there already. Come on, what 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 will what'll solve this? And it just seems like less and less time is spent understanding the problem. Yet if you think about it, nowhere else in your life do you rush to not understand the problem. You wouldn't want your doctor to be like, ah, I don't want to run all those tests. I'm just gonna come up with something. You know, and, and so we have this accidental thinking now, which has come from misinterpretations of agile that, oh my God, we just have to go faster. How do we make UX faster? Oh, well, we boil it down to this micro sky thing where we just get to sketching already because isn't it just about drawing wireframes anyway that's UX right so I think that it's going to take some personalities like mine maybe some managers to start uh, if your company has been doing those to start stepping back from those and maybe shifting into the more of the ideation workshop that I recommend which again is getting people together in a room to talk about ideas and so I have people do virtual sticky notes of ideas. They're not sketching solutions. They're just working with ideas. And I typically have them write those ideas almost in a user story fashion. That way they're forced to make sure they're thinking about real user needs. But of course, earlier in the, in the workshop, I've given them a huge amount of information on the user. So, you know, how do we stop doing something we started doing at, the, at our company? We have to take another look at why we started doing it. Chances are we started doing it because someone said, how do we make all this UX crap go faster? And how can I be included? I like to sketch. I have good ideas. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it, it, it came from how fast can we go and things like that. And when you look at the origins of things like design sprints and MVP, they were actually originally invented for startups. And most startups are founded by people who aren't UX people and they don't hire UX people. So MVP and design sprints were like, how can we bake in a little bit of UX and, and micro UX approach to a micro company who doesn't have real UX people working there who would otherwise undertake a real UX process, even if it's a bit of a shortened one? Mm -hmm. And so we've made the mistake of thinking, oh, this is cool for startups. We should be doing it at Macy's, Lego, Cisco, you know, and, and, and people are starting to come out and say you know what, I'm not sure these things have really worked for us. MVP has made us strip things down to a point where we are releasing junk that doesn't have customer value. Design sprints sometimes are a popularity contest of who sketched what that day. And what did we really spend on that? If you get seven to 10 people in a room for a week, what were their salaries? And then what happened after that? Right. I read a statistic, something like Lego has done over 150 design sprints and dozens of good things came from that. So I'm thinking, OK, maybe 30. They're not telling me how many. That's like technically a huge failure rate. You know, like if you got something right 20 percent of the time, someone would be like, oh, crap. <laughs> Wait a minute. Maybe we shouldn't do this. Maybe this is a giant waste of time and money. Holy cats. But we, we've told ourselves too many stories. Yeah. We've told ourselves the stories. This is how innovation happens. We've told ourselves this is how teams are built. This We're doing team building. And I say, 
There's so many ways to create innovation. There's so many ways to build teams without watering my job down to nothing and taking it away from mm -hmm. me. So let me ask you, because I really want to get into this topic, uh, talking about the future of UX. We see a lot of companies approaching UX designers to become sprint facilitators. Uh, maybe not a ton of them doing it, but I, I see the puck kind of heading in that direction. Uh, there's constantly the, the argument over UX design specialists versus generalists. And, and what are your thoughts there? Where do you see this going? Where, where's the trajectory of what we're currently on? Well, I mean, there's certainly the trajectory and there's the trajectory I'm looking to create uh, right. with my book and some of the things that, that I do. So, so I believe, so, so what I say in my book is, once upon a time, we cared about UX specialists, and there were great jobs for people like me. And then around 2015, 2016, a whole bunch of books came out that were basically like, we've got to go faster, just ship it, fix it later, which never happens, you know, water it down, how fast can you go? And all of a sudden, um, everything shifted because then trade schools shifted. They said, oh, wait a minute. People don't want these specialists. They want these unicorns and they want people who can do a little bit of stuff. And, and the whole industry shifted with that. Now it's so hard to find a trade school that says they're going to give you a UX certificate or diploma that actually teaches you UX. It's like 10 minutes on UX, six weeks on visual design. So that's been our trajectory. You know, our trajectory's changed. We cared about specialists. Now we don't. Now we care about design sprints. Let's design by committee. Everyone's a designer. UX should teach people to do their jobs and teach people to be better designers. And, and I believe there's, I'm hearing too many veteran voices who are saying, okay, but look what's happening. I mean, we only have to keep reading TechCrunch and The Verge and Tech News to see companies like Skype, who spent tens of millions of dollars releasing a version of Skype in 2017 that was universally hated. It was hated so badly that they had to apologize in their blog and spend all this money undoing mm -hmm. it. And when I read what, what that was, to me, and I didn't work there and I don't know anyone who did, but to me it reads like a we skimped on UX. It reads like someone got so excited about pursuing a certain feature or upgrade or change that no one was willing to say, let's do some UX research on this and validate if that's really where our product should go. No, no, this is a great idea. Do it. Okay, well, how about I build a prototype and we do some user testing and see if that's the way to go? No, no, no. This is awesome. Just build it. So my guess is that UX was skimped on, and we're starting to see UX problems affect stock price. We're starting to see it increase companies' risk. We're starting to see how fast it is to come up with a new company. That you know, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Netflix has all this competition from new streaming services. Where'd they come from? Well, they've been working on this, and and so I believe that the trajectory is going to change more into 2020, where people are going to once again say. Okay, holy cats, we gave a lot of UX work to a lot of um, less experienced, less qualified people. We tried to really speed it up. And you know what? I think that bit us in the butt a little bit too much. I think that we should probably shift where there should be a balance between juniors on the team who need mentoring and support and help leveling up their craft and seniors who can really show up and know exactly the right things to do, do them in an agile and lean fashion and mentor those juniors and really build a strong practice so that we're improving uh, customer value, customer uh, satisfaction. And, and one thing I noticed the other day when I was writing, because my book, I joke, it's the Winchester Mystery House, which is the house that was built for 37 years. Uh, Google it. Um, one thing I was writing the other day was someone was complaining on LinkedIn that like, oh, UX and user centered design, it's so bloated. And I was like, bloated? What, you know, what's wrong with it? Usually I pick and choose what a project needs that automatically makes it unbloated. What, what do you mean? And the person wrote, um, well, you know, UX is just too focused on customer goals and not focused enough on business goals and listening to stakeholders. And I said, you know, I've been hearing that a lot. I better write something about it in the book. And I started writing and all of a sudden I found myself writing, why are business goals and customer goals so far apart? Why haven't, we can't make the customer shift their goals. Their needs are their needs, their habits, their motivations, their pain points. That's what it is. We have noticed over all this time with our interfaces and products, we can't change them. It's very hard to change them. 
Yet, if you read the original definition of agile, you're supposed to shift entire product roadmaps and strategies when you get feedback from customers that tells you you're Mm -hmm. going in the wrong direction. That's baked into the original definition of agile. Why aren't stakeholders and business goals being shifted, rethought, rewritten to say, oh, holy cats, you know, we made these assumptions and guesses about our customers we weren't right. We're going to have to shift that. I don't understand why business goals and customer goals aren't more aligned. And then we, we, we hold UX up and go, see, it's you. You're this break in this mm-hmm. process. We've got, there's got to be some way to take you out of it so that the stakeholders can get what they want. Well, and I'm sure you've seen this in your experience. I feel like business is often focused on more of the macro, right? They're, they're focused on like, we need to do things to appease our investors. We need to do things to improve the stock price. We need to do things to bring in more revenue. And those are never going to be your customer's goals, uh, but those are the business goals. But they can. Yeah, but my point is they can because in reality, if we have a good product, the customers want to buy it. Like great UX makes sales have an easier time selling, sales have an easier time retaining, marketing doesn't have to break their butt uh, as much as as they do, marketing doesn't have to clean up messes out on social media when you've done a better job with yeah. UX. And that's why I talked earlier about partnering with marketing. This was something that came up when I was writing the book. I've, I'm doing like 15 interviews with people from different disciplines, and the person for marketing was like, here's where we partner. And she was so right. She's like, look, we have all these KPIs and OKRs and UX are the people who can follow through on nearly all of them. Why aren't we working more closely Mm -hmm. together? I'm like, holy cats. What a great question. Let's write about this. Let's talk about this. So I believe that if UX can connect more with marketing, because they know what those the business goals mm-hmm. are. So let's say the business goal is I want I want people to buy more. You know, I want I want people to buy more often. I want them to buy more business goals. Now that doesn't mean the customer doesn't want to do those things. What the customer doesn't want is the prescribed way that somebody wrote into the requirements or stories to make it happen. That someone did a dark pattern and threw something in your shopping cart you weren't expecting or did a bait and switch. I put a I put something in my shopping cart the other day when I went to check out the price was doubled. Mhm. Hey, hey, I noticed. So I think the problem is that we've gone from business goals, which in many cases can be aligned with customers' goals. They're on your site. They want to buy something. Like, okay, we have some some common goals here. But when I feel like some non-UX people have come in and said, and here's how we're going to achieve that. We're going to make them sign up to the mailing list. We're going to pop up crap. We're going to put stuff in their shopping cart. We're going to hound them to the ends of the earth. We're going to call, make a salesperson call them 12 times a day. You know, then I go, oh, wait a minute. This isn't aligned. And then someone says to me, you don't care about business goals enough, Debbie. And so I think that we have to remember what the difference between goals and and high-level strategies and the execution of ideas. Leave the execution to UX. Tell me the goals. You'd be surprised how much they will line up if we really think about it. It's It's the ideas and the executions where they don't line up. And that is so much where I think we have to bring back the expertise of great UX and CX practitioners who are going to say, great, you told me your problem and your goal. I know how to handle this. Give me some time. So how can early UX designers or entry-level UX designers help influence the company to return to quality over speed then? Yeah, I think the younger people are not going to be able to do that because in general, companies don't always respect those people uh, because of their their youth. Even if I mean, I was this person at age four. And so uh, this has always been me. I didn't kind of grow into Mm -hmm. this. This was I came out this way, evidently. Um, So sorry, Um, you can grow into this, but it's probably more common that you just showed up like this. But I think that. This is ultimately something for management to tackle. I feel like if the boots on the ground people start evangelizing too much or fighting too much, the evangelism's really been backfiring Mm -hmm. for us because if we've been siloed, if we've been seen as artsy fartsy hipsters, if we're seen as time and budget wasters, but then we want to hold a meeting and show you our PowerPoint on how important we are. Oh my God, everyone hates us even more. Like, who are these losers telling me how great they are? Get them out of here. So I feel like the young people should probably mostly stay out of this. 
and talk to their management and leadership. Hopefully they're in a company with some sort of UX hierarchy, which would imply more UX CX maturity, which may not be there. I feel so many young people get hired as the only UX UI person at a company. Mm -hmm. So that, but that person still has a manager. Maybe that manager is a product manager. Maybe that person's a marketing manager. Maybe it's an engineering manager. But um, I have lots of suggestions in the book, but the key is going to be stop telling people to have empathy. Low empathy people don't have empathy. Even when you tell them to have empathy, we're going to have to do this with numbers. We're going to have to do this by proving that great UX work creates the ROI they're looking for and meets or exceeds our, our goals and numbers and that poor or skimped on or other flavors of bad UX um, tend to lose us time, lose us money. And and you're going to have to just go for that. You're going to have to take the emotions out of it. I think UX people can be very emotion-based. Like, well, don't you care about the customers? Don't you care? And say that to yourself, but most stakeholders and most of the people in the other departments we work with, they, they kind of don't. They say they do. They kind of don't. We're just going to have to put on our math hats and start tying it back to numbers. Mm -hmm. So then with that, this is kind of a change in note, but along the same vein, is there a way to influence uh, more critical thinking uh, within the company? Or is there a way to, I, I mean, I know you've got some thoughts on design thinking, and maybe we can go there as well. Uh, but how would you influence, I guess, that, uh, that thought, uh, I guess, being centered on yeah, the Yeah, to me, to me, design thinking is another thing that's actually hurting us because design thinking, if you if you read it, it says, hey, here's what the UX process is. Step one, empathize. Well, how long did you spend on step one? How long did you spend on empathizing? You didn't. It's not a step. You're naturally a high empathy person when you're a great UX practitioner. It's not a step. In the process, if we have to tell people step one, empathize or ready, set, empathize, that means you weren't empathizing already, which means you might not naturally be a high empathy person, which means I might not be able to make you more empathetic. So the problem with something like design thinking is it was someone's attempt. It was great in the original definition in 2007, 2008, but it got bastardized along the way like so many other things. And now it's like, hey, in five easy steps, check, 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 you're doing UX. Mm -hmm. Step one, empathize, check. Step two, whatever, check. Step three, sketch crap, check. And and there's no there seems to be no uh, real UX process there. You're definitely skimping on so much of the research that's important. Again, how can we solve a problem when we haven't fully deeply understood the problem and the people having it? So these these processes that go to water UX down and boil us down to quickie steps, I believe are going in the wrong direction. So let me po you know poke on that a little bit because I think. I want to clarify, you're not saying that empathy is not important in the process. Right. I'm just saying when we expect low empathy people to have empathy because we said show up to our meeting and step one, empathize. Mm -hmm. um, I have found in my business and my personal life that there is no way to get low empathy people to be higher empathy. Sometimes you can get them to have sympathy, not the same thing. Sometimes you can't even get them yeah. to have sympathy. And if, if people aren't too sure what I mean, hang out on your Facebook feed a little yep. bit. Say something slightly controversial about poor people <laughs> or someone in right. need and watch the responses. Write something about someone in need and watch how many low empathy responses come in and think about how you are never going to get Cousin Joe to change his mind about that and to see that poor person's life through their eyes and right. their needs. So I think we are setting ourselves up for deception and failure when we imagine that we can go up to someone or hold a meeting and go, all right, everybody, now we're going to empathize. No, and, and, and I totally get that. I guess I guess what I'm trying to get at, though, is there's a lot of tools that we've created uh, to help people with low empathy try and become more empathetic. For example, in the in the process, we we teach that uh, there should be customer journey maps that are created or personas that are created. And the whole the whole gist of those is just to help empathize for the user. What are your thoughts on putting work into personas or customer journey maps? 
I absolutely love those, but I want talented UX specialists to make them. I believe that we're going in the wrong direction when we bring other people in the room and ask them for their guesses and assumptions about customers or things they think they've noticed. When we do it by committee, we are inviting assumptions and guesses. And there's almost no, absolutely, there's almost no methodology on the planet that supports assumptions, guesses, and potential bias. And so if I make a series of, if I make a bunch of customer journey maps and I make a bunch of personas, I absolutely want to share and socialize them. That doesn't guarantee that people still have empathy for that person. So something that I do in my in my speaking uh, tour and my workshops that I do for non-UX people is when I've got a, wor- a workshop length of time, I do a quick 10-minute exercise. I give them a persona of a senior citizen with Parkinson's disease that I made for a real project. I give them a real persona that I did. And I say, this woman's just lost her husband. She's moved. She has to buy homeowners or renters insurance. Let's make a customer journey map for how she might go about researching and finding insurance. And I don't give them anything else, but, you know, which is a little skewed already. But I just say, just give it a try. You know, you've got a persona. I've told you a little bit about her story. You know, let's map her journey. And nearly every single person in the room maps a different journey Mm. because everybody is telling her story and they're guessing because they have no other data. Whereas a UX or CX person hopefully has done listening labs, has done interviews, has done uh, field studies. Hopefully we've done other things to bring the color, the full color to this person where we can say, we're not guessing about what her journey is. We talked to 10, 15, 20 people just like her. We know what her journey is. So at the end, when people, I say, how many people have her starting asking Siri what to do? How many people have her posting to Facebook? How many people have her talking to an insurance agent? There's like five or six ways she can start this process. The room's usually evenly divided. And I go, which one's the right one? Which one are we going to build features, product, software around? Are we overspending on bad guesses? Mm -hmm. So I let, and then people are like, oh crap. And usually because I'm doing this normally for a room full of engineers, which still stereotypically skew quite male, they're they're like, "Uh, this was really hard. I don't know how to pretend I'm a female senior citizen with Parkinson's disease. I don't I don't understand what she needs. And I go, and that's okay. That's why people like me swing in, take care of this for you, and then tell you all about it later. Right. So I believe strongly in all of the UX deliverables. Um, I believe in the UX documentation, though I think we could be a little leaner in that area. Um, not going in the direction of the lean UX book. The lean UX book to me is uh, garbage. But we could, based on the original definition of lean, we could be leaner. But I believe in all these things, but I believe in them being done by specialists. I can't think of a reason to have these really important, critical things be done by assumptions, guesses, biases, people with horses in the Mm -hmm. race, um, people who have possible outcomes they're shooting for. Um, So... So that's where I think it's going wrong, and that's why my ideation workshop idea starts with UX and CX doing all these things, spending a couple of hours first sharing them with everybody, showing them videos, showing them quotes, really getting them immersed in that customer's experience. Then let's just come up with ideas. You don't have to sketch it. You don't have to say how it works. Just give me ideas. We'll take it from you there. know, and so I mean, we're about at time, but I, I think what this comes back to then is your your comment you made about returning to quality over speed. In a speed scenario, this is going to be so hard to do. I have found that uh, prior to working where I was at today, a couple years back, I was working for Adoption.com, and when I was working for Adoption.com as a UX designer, I realized that guess what? I'm not a birth mother. I'm not someone who's going to be placing my child for adoption. Um, Sure. And one of the things that we did that made a huge difference for me is that on a monthly basis, we would bring panels of people in to just share their stories uh, and to allow us to do some more interviewing, yes, but just a lot more listening. Um, and it was just mind-blowing how how little I knew about it, though thinking from an outsider's perspective, no, I get it. You have a baby. You can't have it. You got to put it up for adoption. And you just don't, you don't know how hurtful some of those words are. You don't know. Sure. Uh, you, there's just a lot of it you just don't understand until you get to take some time and really dive into those details. So I I, I totally agree with you in in your context about we've got 
deliverables. Sure, we could be more lean in those. I agree. Uh, but if we can return to quality over speed, um, it, it does, I think, get us closer to hitting the right answers. If you can return to the research and return to the data and less hypothesis and a less bias that and don't skimp on testing. Exactly. I think we do come to a better end solution. I appreciate all and that's going to be better for the oh quickly and that's going to be better for all the newbies out there because when we return back to quality you're not going to be expected to be a unicorn you can just focus on the things you're great at and show up to a job and go i am really great at these things yes i'm new but i'm really great at these things and watch me that's grow. awesome i appreciate your time debbie you've uh, you've shared a lot of great insight and i personally am taking a lot of notes Thanks. as we talk um <laughs> i'll give you one more opportunity we're going to be plugging the delta cx book which comes out in september uh, the link to it. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah, we're yeah, so, uh, I mean, if nothing else, go to DeltaCX.com. There should be a website up. There is, you know, while you and I are talking, there isn't, but there will okay. be. And uh, and check Amazon as well. And uh, people can also, uh, again, just go to DeltaCX.com. And the book is, is huge. It's tremendous, but it's going to be burning down a lot of things going wrong with UX and CX and building back up what I believe is the much better way we should be, the new trajectory we should be uh, experiencing. Well, and I, I actually personally look forward to reading this book because there's a lot of the books that you talk about that have become like the go-to UX books and you've got a lot to say about them. And why? Uh, yeah. So Part I'm, two. I'm excited to get back <laughs> to this book once it comes out. Um, I also want to maybe encourage people, if you're all right with this, that you're very active on LinkedIn. And I feel like every day I get to read something that I was like, oh, that's interesting. So I'm going to encourage to try and find you on link people to try and find you on LinkedIn uh, and follow I am along. easy to find. Yeah, please follow me. I don't always add people as connections. It would just be too overwhelming for my feed to have a zillion people. But please do uh, click the follow button and interact with me and, and comment. Uh, I'd love to hear even if you disagree. So uh, on LinkedIn, I'm just LinkedIn slash in slash Debbie Levitt, one word. So easy to find me. It's this with more Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Debbie, thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Uh, and for everyone listening, I, I'll just speak for them. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. This has been fantastic. Thank you. Thanks for including me. That's a wrap on Design Today. We'll see you next time.